This podcast may contain content that is graphic and disturbing in nature. Listener discretion is advised. As a top lawyer and human rights advocate, this woman has fought tirelessly for gender equality in her home country, helping women to move beyond a historical culture of injustice. This is the Karuna Nandi story. Megan, you packing your bags? I mean, it's a little early, but I'm getting really excited. We're going to Dallas. We're going to Dallas for the True Crime Podcast Festival. Megan, unfortunately, you were not with me last time, but I went and it was so much fun. And that's where I met our good friends at LA Not So Confidential. Oh, yeah. Shiloh and Scott, which is cool because we're collaborating with them on a session about the Sherry Papini case, which I am so looking forward to. Yes. So if you're interested in going, check out our Instagram and we will have a discount code. We hope to see some of our listeners there. We look forward to meeting you. Definitely. Thank you, Amy. Before we get into today's story, we have some patrons to thank. All right. Today, we'd like to say a big thank you to Vanessa, Summer, Caitlin F., Beverly Hebert, Benji, who is the dog of one of our supporters. Oh, you know how we love our dogs. And Ayla. Amy, who else do we have? We also have Sammy, Stephanie Lynn, Bren, Desiree, And Ariana, who's from the Pacific Northwest, and she is an adult figure skater who listens to us from the rink. Get out. Isn't that cool? We have have just the coolest (laughs) listeners. We really do. Thank you, everyone, so much. Yeah, we really appreciate all of your support. So, you know, lately I've spend almost as much time researching what case I'm going to cover than actually the case. Because, I, yeah. you know, now that we're going weekly and we have so much content bet- between the show and Patreon, I'm just constantly like wanting to be better and better. I feel like uh, constantly we're having these phone calls. Yes. Uh, this case, this case, I you know, know, we have so many in mind. We're, we're diving Maybe in. Maybe we should go tri-weekly. Oh my gosh, please. We don't have enough time for that. Go ahead. (laughs) So I've been reading a lot of stories lately about women fighting to protect their rights, not only in America, but in in several other countries, such Mm -hmm. as India and Egypt. And these are places where women have substantially less rights than we do. And I was decided I want to cover one of these cases. Oh, good. So like I do, I started researching cases of you know, violence against women in these countries. And I found it very troublesome that almost every story I read changed the name of the victim to protect the women's anonymity. I know what you're going to ask. Why is that a bad thing? Yeah. Okay. I knew you were going to say that. Because normally I would support victim anonymity because it's a way to protect the victim's privacy. Mm -hmm. However, in these cases, it is used as a way to further oppress women by not allowing them to tell their story due to fear of retaliation. Okay. So women yeah. in these countries are sometimes being silenced via, you know, the threat of violence. And this could be either directly or indirectly. So it should be their choice either way. I think it would. Absolutely. We, we would agree. So this episode is going to be a bit different than normal because mm-hmm. it's going to first focus on the issue of women's rights mm-hmm. and violence against women in developing countries. Then we're going to spend some time on an advocate who has done some work in this area. Ah, trailblazer. Yeah, we love those. We haven't done one in a while. I know. Yeah. Great. I love it because it's international. It's a trailblazer. And I have no idea where you're going with this yet. So So, Megan, we know and many of our listeners know that daily women in this country always fighting for justice, you know, against sexual violence and other types of violence against women. But we need to acknowledge that women in other countries are fighting for their lives on a daily basis in a much more extensive way. Right. So after diving into several topics Mm -hmm. around violence against women, I came across one woman in particular, Karuna Nandi, who deserves to be highlighted for the work she's doing to help stop these grave injustices against women. But before we get to this trailblazer for women's rights, we need to set the foundation. Okay. Now, we know there are many different forms of violence against women. Yes. But in this episode, we're going to focus on sexual violence in particular. Okay. Do you teach on that, I'm assuming? I do. When I when I cover the class women in crime, I talk about international violence uh, in other countries and what type of sexual violence is used. I talk about human trafficking. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I do cover it. Pro- 
probably more broadly though yeah. you know um then you know because we could teach a whole course just on that yeah you know? I, I very very briefly touch on it in my intro class right. but i figured you dived a little deeper in your women in crime class i do i yeah. do i i definitely also talk about it um in policy as well okay so generally speaking just to give context 90 percent of adult rape victims are female 82% of all juvenile sex assault victims are female. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., one in five women experience completed or attempted rape during their lifetime. One in five? Yes. Yeah, I knew that number was high. One in three have experienced some form of intimate partner violence. And between 10 and 14% of married women will experience rape by their intimate partner. That's surprising. That's shocking. Yeah. So all of these are shocking, but I want to take a moment and dissect this one in particular. So we're talking about marital rape here. Right. So this is sometimes referred to as spousal rape, and it's defined as the act of sexual intercourse with one's spouse without the spouse's consent. Okay. So the lack of consent is the essential element. Okay. It's considered both a form of domestic violence and sexual abuse in the U.S. And at one point, it wasn't even illegal. At one point, there was no marital um, spousal provision for a sexual assault. Yeah, you're actually right. Because right here in the U.S., it wasn't until the mid-1990s that marital rape was not recognized in all U.S. states. So now, luckily, all U.S. states recognize marital rape as a form of of rape. But in most of the world, any form of rape historically was seen as a crime against the man with women being equated as a man's property, right? So by definition, a husband could not rape his wife. I remember learning about this specifically in our law class. When we got our PhD. Yeah, that was where we really examined marital rape laws and how they've evolved. And I was shocked. I was shocked. And I teach penology. I used to I haven't taught in a while a history of punishment. Right. And I, I remember talking about this in there as well. And my students were shocked yeah. to know that you know, women were equated with property. Yep. So as I mentioned, it's now recognized in all U.S. states. However, there are still many issues. Mm -hmm. You're not going to believe this, but in 20 jurisdictions, there are still some exemptions given to husbands from rape prosecution. For example, and I'll highlight a case, but what I mean by this, that in some jurisdiction, there are still legal loopholes where if a husband does not use force against his wife, therefore she is unable to consent or not consent, then that is not considered rape because rape has to be done by force. So let me give you an example of a okay. recent case in Minnesota where a husband was drugging his wife and raping her. But there was this legal loophole because she was incapacitated, she could not say no. That's and, the loophole. And it was not forceful because she didn't fight back. I was going to say that that fits with all the like stereotypes <laughs> that crazy. you used to think of, right? We're if someone's about, not I mean, fighting, you know, if they're not punching and screaming. We're talking about 2021 here. So this man was never prosecuted on the felony rape charge, but he was charged with two misdemeanors, criminal sexual conduct in the fifth degree, which was later dismissed and interfering with privacy in the home. So he took a plea and he served just 29 days in jail. I but mean, there's some good news because the victim in this case was instrumental in closing that legal loophole in which the act had to be, quote, forceful in order to qualify as a rape. And now the exemption no longer exists. Wow. In Minnesota, at least. OK. This is all as it pertains to the U.S. Yeah. Is your case one that's going to happen in the U.S. or are we going to go international with this? Well, you won't believe this, but as of late 2021, marital rape is not recognized as a crime in 36 countries around the world, some of which are developing nations. I do believe that. It's horrifying, but I do, like I said, I taught and know a little bit about this, so I do. So today's episode is going to focus on one of these countries, which is India. Okay. In India, it is legal for a man to have non-consensual sex with his wife. Now, the country adheres to the antiquated colonial law. Now, the current laws do criminalize any form of sexual assault and domestic violence. However, the crime is prevented from being called rape if it's between a husband and wife. Essentially, you can't hit your wife, but you can rape her. All right. I'm sorry. There, I, no, I had to think <laughs> yeah. about it for a second. So you're saying, okay, so domestic assault is illegal. Correct. But sexual assault is permissible. They don't believe it's sexual assault. It's they not don't call it. They don't call it rape if it's okay. between a husband and a wife. Okay. So because of this caveat, women are often the victim of sexual abuse by their spouses. A national survey published by the India government in 2018 found that 86 percent of female sexual violence survivors surveyed had been assaulted by their former or current husband. Megan, 86 percent who were willing to admit to it because we know how underreported these yeah. statistics are. Yeah. Another published study had found that 32 percent of women in India who had ever been married had experienced spousal, physical, sexual or emotional violence. 
But you know what I find interesting? What? Another survey that was published by the government as well said that 99% of sexual assaults go unreported. 99%? Yes, which I swear I read that like five times because that sounded so high. So what they're saying is okay. that only 1% of all sexual assaults are actually reported. What these surveys were saying is that 86% of the female sexual violence survivors who were surveyed. Oh my gosh. Right, so we're talking about two totally wow. different, we're talking about two totally different cohorts. I think it's interesting that there is an acknowledgement that sexual assaults are unreported, but yet these numbers are also pretty high for females that say they had been assaulted by their former or current husband. Right. That's what, that's what I'm It's trying. very confusing. Yeah, I was having you trouble wrapping every... my head around that one. So was I. That's why I thought it was so important <laughs> to talk about yeah. because it's, it's very confusing. <clears throat> and as we briefly highlighted a moment ago, sexual assault generally is underreported. And you have to add to that the fact that this is domestic and women are not protected by their country because there's a lot of fear of retaliation mm -hmm. if you report being the victim. Oftentimes you're not believed right. and then there's a retaliation against the person in which you're claiming harm to. In fairness, we suffer in the U.S. from the same situation. There, are, there is a fear of reporting. There's a shame of reporting and then a fear of retaliation. So I see parallels here. So the definition of rape, as it's stated in the Indian Penal Code, mm -hmm. is that it includes all form of sexual assault involving non-consensual intercourse with a woman. However, there are exceptions. One which reads, unwilling sexual intercourse between a husband and wife over 15 years of age. This essentially immunizes such acts from prosecution. As per current law, a wife is presumed to have given perpetual consent to have sex with her husband upon entering into a marriage. Oh my gosh. Luckily, many advocates recognize the issue with this and they are fighting for a change. The Supreme Court of India and various high courts have been flooded with writ petitions. You know what a writ is, but I'll tell our listeners. Uh -huh. So a writ is simply an order by a higher court to a lower court or courts directing them to do something or stop them from doing something. Mm -hmm. It's really just like a form of a written command to the court directing them to take some sort of specific action. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these petitions have been challenging the constitutionality of this marital exemption. Right. In a recent landmark judgment, the Supreme Court criminalized unwilling sexual contact with a wife between 15 and 18 years of age. So once you're over the age of 18, you can't claim marital rape. But if you are between the ages of 15 and 18 and you are married, then your husband cannot rape you. Well, of course, I don't like that they haven't gone the full way, but I do appreciate that they're starting with younger females. Well, also very recently, a couple of months ago, a bill was introduced by the government in India to increase the minimum legal age for women to marry from 18 to 21. Has that bit that's introduced and not passed at this point? Introduced. Okay. The latest decision came in May of 2020 when the Delhi High Court delivered a split verdict with one of the judges favoring striking down the marital provision. However, the other holding that it was not unconstitutional. Mm. So this is currently still pending. Yeah. So, I mean, it seems like this is on the agenda of their criminal justice system. Yeah. One lawyer who's very involved in these arguments is an outspoken advocate for women's rights, a woman by the name of Karuna Nundi. I was wondering where we were going to factor this <laughs> yes, woman in, and so then this is, okay, got Kar it. Karuna Nundi is the subject of today's episode, and Karuna was born in Bhopal, India on April 28th, 1976. Now, from a young age, she was interested in civic service and giving back to her community. Now, this isn't surprising once you hear what her parents do. Oh, okay. So while she was growing up, her father had worked at Harvard Medical School. Oh, okay. Can't get much more prestigious than that, wow. right? Wow. But he left to work in a public hospital in India. Love that. Her mother had a prestigious academic job at the London School of Economics. Oh, wow. But then she left after learning that a cousin was born with cerebral palsy. She left to start the Spastic Society of Northern India. Just for our listeners who may not be aware, spastic means involuntary muscle movement. Yeah, and that understood. was the and that was the organization that Karuna's mom started. So it's very clear that this whole family has, you know, com you know, giving back to the community is very important oh, wow. to them. Oh wow! No, I can totally see, totally civic minded, caring. Yes, yeah. And some reports say there was a particular experience that Karuna had as a young girl that also may have helped spark her need to defend the rights of women. Okay. At the age of fifteen, she reported being stalked by a classmate in school who threatened to sexually assault her. 
However, her concerns were dismissed by officials when they reported it. So her mother tried to advocate for her, not surprisingly. Yeah. This is just speculation, but it seems like their cries went unheard because women were not really taken seriously or listened to. Karuna studied economics at St. Stephen's College in Delhi and then worked shortly as a journalist before she started studying law at the University of Cambridge and Columbia University Law School. Wow, that's so cool. I mean, she's clearly top notch if you can do that, right? It's just cool. I read that she had applied to film school, law school, and journalism school because she didn't really know what she wanted to do, but her law school acceptance had come through first. And we're lucky that's the path she took because she would excel and go on to do incredible things for society. It was clear very early on in Karuna's career that like her parents, she had the intelligence and perseverance to tackle really tough issues. Now, when she was at Columbia, she was awarded the prestigious Human Rights Fellowship. She was also a clerk for an African-American judge who was a former human rights lawyer. Her work was highly regarded and she quickly climbed the ranks. In fact, Karuna was one of the few women to preside over the UN tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. She also worked for the UN as a global advocacy officer, assisting with the Secretary General's report on conflict prevention. This is a seriously impressive woman. Yeah, she makes me feel lazy. Okay. Stop it. <laughs> this is so, wait till you're, this is like nothing. This is like the wow. tip of, yeah. So not long into her career, about six years, she felt it was time to return home and she was ready to devote herself to public service in her home country of India. This was the result of reading about some severe human rights violations that were mostly targeting women. Mm -hmm. This was around age 26 that she said, quote, I wanted to contribute to international human rights and constitutional law from India where the impact could be more direct. Yep. And she said it was really the love of her homeland, the people and her culture that brought her back to India. That's fabulous. Yep. So she went back and became a Supreme Court lawyer. Wonderful. Yeah. And she got chills. I just got right? chills. I yeah, I did. And she hit the ground running when she returned home to India. In 2012, a horrific crime occurred in Delhi and drew national attention. As Karuna said in an interview, 2012 was a, quote, inflection point. The first time that people of all ages, genders, and sexualities came out on the streets against sexual violence and violence against women. She continues, my city was the center of this national and to some extent global she calls protest. There was really this like global protest going on. And I think once I tell you the story, I think you'll recognize the story as well. But this is when Karuna says she felt as if this was no longer just a woman's problem or a girl's problem. This was everybody's problem. Mm -hmm. It's actually so horrendous that I was considering an episode. And once I read the details, I was like, no, I know which no. case you're going to talk about. You do. I do. Okay. So just a brief summary of this horrendous case. This is known as the Nirbaya case. A woman by the name of Jodi Singh was at the center of it. Now, this was a brutal gang rape and murder of this young woman on a public bus. Mm -hmm. So Jodi was a med student. Her and a male friend got on a bus. Now, this bus was actually what was known as a taxi mm -hmm. in the area. And they were taking it to, you know, it was like they were going home. They, were, they went to a movie. It was early in the evening. They brutalized her and her friend and they left her for dead to really succumb to her injuries. I know. For, she was left for dead and eventually she would succumb to her injuries. Let's yes. leave it at that. Mm -hmm. The community was outraged as they should be. And this is what sparked all these protests. And as Karuna explains, this was kind of a point, and as she says, an inflection point. Everyone was just outraged by what went on. Mm -hmm. A Delhi court did issue death warrants for all four of those convicted in the case. So they were taking it seriously. And not only did Karuna work closely with the victim's family, she contributed to India's anti-rape bill, which on March 21st, 2013, amended the law by redefining rape. So basically, it expanded the definition of rape and says explicitly that the absence of a physical struggle does not equal consent. Oh, that was a big step. Very big step. Now, this bill did a lot more than that. The bill also added new crimes to protect women, including stalking, mm. voyeurism, acid violence, and disrobing. Oh, wow. Do you know what disrobing is? I don't think so, no. So it's a common crime in India. It's when a man uses force to any woman with the intention of disrobing or compelling her to be naked. Huh. And it carries um, a sentence of three to seven years plus a fine. Well, I think it should. So I just haven't heard it referred to. We don't see it perpetuated much in the United States. That's why you probably haven't heard of it. Okay. Other areas of reform included better procedures for gathering evidence, protecting women during the trial procedure, 
I mean, this bill is this bill is huge. The bill also said that all healthcare providers must give survivors of sexual violence or acid attacks free and immediate medical care, regardless of insurance. Right. The punishment is also harsher for rapists, including death in some cases, as I mentioned in the Jody Singh case. Yeah. And I want to stop and say this was interesting. While many countries were going away from the death penalty, India introduced it in a much bigger way in 2013 as a response to Jody's case. Mm-hmm. Megan, I know you talk about this in your policy class. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying if I think these gentlemen should have been put to death or not, but is it good policy when it is the result of a heinous crime? So, no. Um, most policy. Uh, th- the reason why is that most policies are, are a knee-jerk reaction to, to something heinous, to an, a charged event. And what's the issue with that, though? Because policy, in order to work, requires planning and collaboration. So when you pass it too quickly, it's destined not to work the way it was. On a personal note, I'd like to say that I'm, I'm fine with the death warrants in their case. Of course. And I don't, I think you'd be hard Press to find anyone who wasn't. I think you would be as well. Yeah. I thought it was well deserved. But in yes. general, the policy passed quickly like that will not achieve its goals, usually. And actually, the policy, from what I understand, has not changed much because from what I read, rapes have not decreased. In other words, this has not been a deterrent. Well, the death penalty, as we know in the U.S., is not much of a deterrent. It doesn't usually achieve that goal, although it's supposed to. I think the goal it, the goal it was trying to achieve, well, it was definitely... Retribution, Retribution, right? Because of the outrage. Also, maybe they thought it would be a general deterrent to individuals. And of course, incapacitation, right? If you're dead, you you can't harm anyone anymore. I mean, that's the discussion around death penalty. It achieves retribution and incapacitation. It doesn't usually achieve deterrence. Karuna and others also tried to amend the marital exemption in this bill because it's like, why not? This is a time where people are doing things. Mm -hmm. But the government refused to address marital rape at this time, saying that there wasn't, quote, a societal consensus on the issue. Maybe there isn't a societal consensus. How do you even measure that, though? It's so subjective. It is and it's not. I mean, we do talk about we measure we measure by surveys the consensus about what people think are crimes in the U.S., like what what people consider very serious. And then we see a breakdown when it comes to like drug crimes, victimless crimes. Yeah. Perhaps there was. I mean, I'm surprised with all the other... I couldn't find any data to support uh, it. Then there, there might that not be. That doesn't mean it's not there, though. And it's surprising given like, how the overarching issues that they wouldn't consider it, but, you know... But maybe they also felt that they were doing... So, there were so many reforms in uh-huh. that bill that it was just... They had to draw the line somewhere. I'm not sure. Perhaps it's power structure. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can explain yeah. that. But Karuna didn't give up. She continued her fight trying to criminalize marital rape in India. The first petition to do so was filed at the Delhi High Court in 2015 by a nonprofit called the RIT Foundation. More petitions followed in 2017, including one by the All India Democratic Women's Association. And that association, Karuna, is actually representing in court, along with three individuals, including a survivor of marital rape. I think what Karuna might be best known for is in 2017, she wrote an open letter to Indian women which was published in Indian Vogue. And I'm going to read some excerpts from it. Basically, she laid out the protection in the country's constitution if women are raped, assaulted, or seeking an abortion, or really demanding fair treatment for an, from an employer. So she was pretty much covering everything, saying, quote, I write to you today so you will know your power. The state must enforce your basic rights, but you are in charge of your flourishing. Promise me you'll back yourself when nobody else will. So I urge you all to read it. It's much longer than that. But she, she's really telling women in Vogue, which is obviously a very um, well distributed publication, Mm -hmm. like you need to do something about what's going on. And she highlights all the areas that people need to take action. She's very brave, very brave. Because of this publication, she received a call from a 26 year old woman in Delhi, who said she had been raped by her husband every night since their arranged marriage two years earlier. She, as many before her, requested anonymity. She was facing immense pressure from her family to make things work. And the woman said that she felt that she had two options, quote, either to just end my life or to revolt, something I'd never done before. The woman, of course, did not want to report her husband to the police or go to the courts because she was probably fearful of retaliation. Of course. But she wanted to get out and she read that article and she contacted Karuna to help her. And of course, Karuna did just that. Karuna went to the local police station and filed an affidavit stating that the woman had left home on her own accord and did not want to be contacted by her family in case they approached the police to search for her. Wow. She then accompanied the woman to the airport to ensure that she safely got on a flight out of the city. 
Wow. Isn't it interesting that she was afraid to tell her family about it? I wonder if that's because it was an arranged marriage. So it's almost as if, it's almost like questioning your family's judgment if you want to divorce after an arranged marriage. Yeah, well, it's arranged. And an arranged marriage implies that there's really not much of a choice. Yeah, it's probably very isolating because... Again, you would be insulting your family if you went to them, and it could be more serious than even insulting. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I, I, I honestly, I, you know, I teach also on a more extreme level and separately, but I teach about also honor killings, which mm-hmm. I do yeah. not feel really have honor. But there could be extreme consequences well, for going against your family. The Shafia family murders Correct. that you covered—that was right. a perfect example of what you're talking about. Right now, this experience seems to be the catalyst for for Karuna's advocacy work in the area of marital rape specifically. Karuna hasn't just advocated on the issue of marital rape. She fights for all kinds of injustices. She specializes in media law and legal policy, commercial litigation and arbitration, and constitutional law. How does she have time for all of it? Wow. I know. One of her biggest victories was in 2016 when she represented an Indian woman in a high-profile case against the second largest airline in India, SpiceJet Airlines. Now, this woman had cerebral palsy. And when she boarded a domestic flight, she was asked by an airline staff member to disembark the flight. Why? They said she didn't look well, and they didn't want her condition to deteriorate over the course of the flight. Of course, she said she was humiliated, and as a result, good for her, she pursued a case against the airline in the Supreme Court. Wow. And the Supreme Court did rule in her favor. All right. The airline had to pay her damages, but more importantly, the policy changed. Mm -hmm. And all air carriers in India have to train their staff on the needs and treatments of different abled travelers. Nice victory there. She also fought for victims and families of those affected in the 1984 Bhopal gas tragedy. Do you know that case? It was very high profile because it was one of the world's worst industrial disasters. Yeah, I do. There was highly toxic gas that leaked from a factory into nearby towns and villages. Mm -hmm. And it killed thousands. Actually, many people say tens of thousands of people were killed. Mm. And it left another half a million people with permanent disabilities and injuries. Right. And this includes lingering birth defects for generations to come. She's certainly not limited. No. The diversity, the diversification of her specialties is really compelling. I mean, maybe it is a cultural difference, but you know, in the US, you do tend to specialize in one area of law, whether Mm -hmm. it's environmental or whether it's family law or criminal law or juvenile, you know what I'm saying? So she's really, um, wow, what a power player, I would say. In a recent interview, she said, quote, when a particular case comes to me, I look at a number of things. One is how much do I care? I do the care test. Caring has a large impact on how complicated and good the case is going to be. She continues, but honestly, sometimes there's a case that doesn't have a hope in hell, but you do it anyway. Mm -hmm. That teaches you a lot about persistence and the value of resistance. You know the value of keeping something alive, even when you are against the biggest corporate governmental nexus there is in the world. Chills from that quote. Right? So that quote is beautiful. And it sounds like, you know, the harder the case is, like, the more she wants to do it. And like she said, if she cares about it, then she's going there. I mean, we can relate at least to that. Like, you know, the, the passion that we feel and caring about it, even when some of these are so hard to handle or talk about or even break down. Yep. The care test. I like that. Karuna has been recognized for all that she has done. In 2020, Forbes magazine named Karuna on their list of self-made women of 2020. She's also a global advocate for free speech and was recently appointed to a UK panel to support media freedom across the world. Rock star. She also serves on Columbia University's Global Freedom of Expression expert panel. Not done, Megan. I I can't believe it. (laughs) She's also actively involved in helping communities with their prevention of sexual harassment policies. Mm -hmm. So she does a lot of work to help create, you know, education modules that train college students and what their rights are to help prevent harassment and discrimination in the workplace. Now, we need more women like this to fight for the voiceless, the powerless, you know, and all these different ways. Because we usually focus on you know, we're, we're a little narrow as compared to her, I guess everyone is. But when we talk about injustice against women, there's, you know, there's a lot to be done. A lot of our listeners write in what they could do. And, you know, I urge you to look outside of criminal justice reform. Or go to law school like she did. And, right? <laughs> I mean, take on every area that interests you. Yeah. You know, I also, um, I love the, that she started as a journalist. I, I never say it, but that was one of the other careers I would have considered. Really? Of course, I wanted to you write. You would have been good at that. Thank you. Of course, well, I, I guess you kind of are a journalist, though, like when you do direct appeal. Definitely. And I mean, some would say we are, yeah. you know, in regards, but... 
writing about, you know, like topics that I was really passionate about and reporting on it. I wanted to report on crime, obviously, yeah. but so I totally, I think that's, that's awesome. awesome that she started in, you know, journalism and then moved on to law. Yeah, they're very much connected. Yeah. Right? So other than what we've highlighted with Karuna specifically, I want to end this by talking about a few other victories for women in India. All right. Okay. You know, we talked earlier about how the government raised the legal age of marriage for women. Mm -hmm. Some feminists argue that this could tighten the grip of parents on young women's personal life. So it could have unintended effects. So again, this is interesting. Something might seem good at face value, but it's important to recognize, you know, the downstream effect. You also have to evaluate policies Mm -hmm. to see if they're achieving their intended goals. Mm -hmm. And early this year, a court upheld a government order banning Muslim girls from wearing headscarves inside schools. Now, this sparked a lot of protests because even before the pandemic, Muslim girls were at a greater risk of dropping out of education. And since 2020, their enrollment has further declined. Mm. As Karuna has commented, because anytime there's, you know, any issue on women's rights, you know, she's right there. She says forcing a woman to take off a hijab is almost just as bad as making her wear one saying that, quote, we can't afford to shut the door to girls in schools. So Karuna is pretty much saying, you know, telling a Muslim girl that they can't wear a headscarf in a school is further alienating them. And it's just as bad as making them wear one. It's limiting women's rights. Of course. Either way, it's taking choice away. Yeah, it's taking choice away. There are many other issues that we have not covered here today. So I urge you all to do some research to so you should definitely support UNICEF Gender Equality in India program. Mm-hmm. So if you go to the UNICEF website, you can read all about the program that they have regarding gender equality in India, and they're doing some amazing things. I was doing some research, and I came across a website called GiveIndia.org, mm-hmm. and it has a list of ways to help girls and women in India. Oh, And it's really just a list of non-government organizations that are doing some really awesome work helping women and girls in India. And I urge you all to take a look at them. Gosh, I totally will. I hope at least this case highlights to our listeners that there's a lot of issues in other countries, not just ours. I know a lot of times we focus on cases in our own country because that's what we're the most familiar with. But it's always important to realize what's going on globally. I agree. I mean, we we tend to focus because we're domestic criminologists, yeah. but you know, it's really nice. It's really nice when we take on these international issues. Mm-hmm. And there's things that we take for granted, right? Um, the choice mm-hmm. to get married, yep. the choice to choose your partner. Um, you know, that's something that I take for granted. The choice to walk down the street and feel secure. Right. The choice of what to wear. You know, there's just a lot of things that I think we do take for granted here. Mm -hmm. So these cases put that in perspective for others who may not, you know, have access to the same kind of choice that we do. But also it it helps us to understand cultural differences. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that we're lucky to have choice, but it doesn't mean that other people's cultures and uh, other customs aren't, you know, good or celebrated for for Mm -hmm. reasons. But I do think you're right in that we should be examining Um, female issues on a more global Mm -hmm. level. And if you're listening to this from another country and there's an issue that you think maybe we should highlight here, please let us know because, you know, we we only know what we know. Yeah. Until we do some more research. Until we do some more research. Thank you to Karuna, new trailblazer, someone I didn't know about and someone whose work I am really, you know, really happy to celebrate. Yeah, I hope it inspired you all the way it inspired us. Yep. Thank you so much, Amy, for bringing us this great case today. And before we go today, Megan, let's just take a few of our questions. Um, One question is, what are your master's and PhDs in? So I will go first. I have my master's in forensic psychology because I was interested in being a therapist or a psychologist in a correctional facility. Then I switched gears a little bit and I decided to get my PhD in criminal justice with a focus on policy. Okay, my master's degree is in criminal justice. And after that degree, I went on to serve as a federal probation officer. And when I went back, I got my PhD in criminal justice with a focus on deviant behavior. But Amy, as you and I also discuss sometimes, we've both spoken about going to law school. So who knows if our, you know, educational journey is over just yet. You do know that I've started researching the next LSAT, so I'm really thinking about it. I know. Kudos. If anyone wants to pay for me to go to law school, let me know and I'm there. (laughs) 
<laughs> okay. Um, the, the next two questions are very similar. So we're combining them. The question is, how did you get interested in the field of criminology or how did you start what you're doing? I became interested in criminal justice at a really young age um, because it was my mom's interest. And one of her hobbies was just watching these crime shows. So I would watch right alongside with her because there wasn't, you know, any Scooby in our house. And I really aspired to become a criminal defense attorney or a prosecutor at some point. But I switched gears after I worked as a paralegal for a couple of years. I realized I didn't want a lawyer, but I was so in the field of criminal justice. And so when I got my master's in it, I had a very inspirational professor who was a former federal officer. And he kind of convinced me to go ahead and take that test. And that really started my career in criminal justice. For me, I was always interested in inequality and social justice from a very young age. And it was just natural for me to become interested in the criminal justice system, because when you look at the way we treat people who are incarcerated and upon reentry, it's very clear that we have some issues there. I think this is where you see those issues play out the most is in the criminal justice system. I agree. And then once I know you feel the same, Megan, once I started studying criminal justice, there was no turning back. I was all in. I was all in, too. But once I worked in, as a federal probation officer, I was also all in on, you know, trying to help reform the system. And oh, my goodness, what have we done and what could we do? So I think we're always looking for what can we do to make it better? Yeah. And for me, I was working in the mental health field and then I was working in the substance abuse field. And I think the common thread was the criminal justice system. So yep. thank you so much for your questions. And we will catch you next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer and editor is James Varga. Music composition is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. You can also support the show through Patreon, where you can get access to additional ad-free content such as virtual happy hours and an extra full-length episode each month. For more information, visit patreon.com slash womenincrime. Sources for today's episode include Time, BBC, RAIN, National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, National Sexual Violence Resource Center, Equatus.org, GlobalCitizen.org, News 18, The Guardian, India Today, Harvard Human Rights Journal, Volume 34, Issue 1, Vogue India, Seema.com, and Forbes India.